Welcome back to our live coverage here at the United Nations Climate Talks. I'm delighted to say that I've been joined by Hugh Montgomery, uh, representing the UK health sector here at the talks. Uh, uh, but before we begin, Hugh, I just noticed a quick question come in uh, via our comments feed asking um, whether we're going to be online every day. So I'll just tell people, yep, from three till six local time in Durban, which I think is from one until four in GMT and from eight until 11 uh, in the new in New York time uh, we'll be online every day for the remainder of the conference so please do tune in uh, Hugh first is first what on earth has health got to do with climate change that's a very interesting question because a survey done by some doctors here last year revealed that that's the question a lot of negotiators were asking mm -hmm. and that's very very worrying mm -hmm. um, essentially for too long climate change has been uh, put into the, the sort of box of physics to do with the atmosphere, mm -hmm. or to do with dollars, mm -hmm. um, and if it's to do with the life at all, it's to do with polar bears and tree frogs. Uh -huh. And it's, climate change is fundamentally, as far as we're concerned, about its impact on humanity. Mm -hmm. So there are two elements to this, essentially. I'll now keep it brief for you. Mm -hmm. The first is that climate change actually has catastrophic effects on human health and survival, no matter what country you're in. Mm -hmm. And whilst many people would say, oh yeah, I've sort of heard that malaria might get a bit better or a bit worse in some areas and there might be a bit more heat stress and that's where they stop. There are actually 13 areas in which it has really colossal impacts on human health. Mm -hmm. So there's a really big and very immediate downside to human health and survival, which will affect developed countries as well as less developed or developing. Mm -hmm. Now on the other side, there's a separate message, which is to say even if you don't want to believe in climate change and you want to ignore it totally, it just so turns out that low carbon lifestyles, so less red meat consumption, less animal saturated fat, slightly more exercise instead of driving, brings with it enormous benefits to human health. So really what's good for the health of the planet is good for the health of human beings and actually good for the health economics as well. So there's a financial win from this too. So that's the two elements. You mentioned that the negotiators didn't seem particularly conscious about the linkage between, yeah. between health and climate change. How is health taken into account at these talks? Is it kind of uh, integrated into the texts or is it kind of a side issue? What's going on? No, it's essentially, it's not in uh, the, the negotiations significantly at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is mention, but there is, it's in no way a, a fundamental consideration at all. Mm -hmm. And it should be. And I'm quite sure that every person that sits in this seat tells you that their area is fundamental and has to be the element. And, I, and I, I, I'm mindful of that. But this really is about an immediate and grave threat to human health and survival. Um, and one that really does very urgently need to be addressed. Uh, and that's why it needs to be there. Because while people still think this is something that can be dealt with slow time, and that something about two degrees or three degrees, well, we just have to negotiate that, or parts per million, or dollars of GDP, or when long-term finance kicks in. When they're focused on those things, they're forgetting about what will happen to them and their children. And do you have a sense of optimism about the, the international response to climate change, not just within these talks, but, but globally? Or is it a pessimistic picture? And, well, you know, is, is it all to play for? What, what's it going to take to get us moving forward? That's a very good question. So, um, and there's no one answer to that. Um, I'm pessimistic of the intellect and optimistic of the soul. If I didn't have a level of optimism that we could do something, I wouldn't bother to be here at all, because there are other things that I could be doing more valuably. Do I think that this process is going to deliver the fundamental scale of change and speed of change that's required? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. Do I think it can be achieved? Yes, I do. How will it be achieved? I've got no idea. Um, except to say that um, humanity has always been good at tipping to suddenly taking action on things. And we don't have very long. I mean, we are measuring this now in a matter of months, you know, a few years, not in longer than that. I suspect that there will be, I'm hoping there will be a tipping point at which, it's a dreadful phrase isn't it, it's overused, there will be a sudden change in the way we all behave that will make this difference. Um, I think there is increasing understanding of this uh, amongst the general public. There's increasing disillusionment with the way in which we run our affairs as humanity. Um, you know, a capital-based system has brought with it enormous benefits and I'm not here as some neo-communist to try and knock it all down at all. I mean, it has brought enormous benefits. But we need to understand how that works, start spending your money differently, start behaving in different ways so that we can continue to live longer, healthier and happier lives. If we continue to always do what we've always done, we're going to get the same sorts of problems 
coming in spades, as we see happening already. And of course, one of the big blockages to, to action is, is this, uh, I don't know whether you would like to call it a sceptic movement or a denier movement, but people who are, who are yet to be convinced by the science. Now, as a geneticist yourself, as somebody who's, I know, gone to a, a great deal of effort to look into the science, yeah. what would you say to that? Well, I mean, I am a scientist. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a religious person. Um, you know, life on Earth will end at some point. We will go the way of all other animals and all other planets. Mm -hmm. We are really stardust in the end. Uh, and we're worm food in the more proximal part of it. Um, so I'm a scientist. I came to this by really accident uh, 11 years or so ago when I was looking at the sorts of science that I do for a day job and next to it in the journals was the hardcore science about climate change at a time when there was increased scepticism I think in the press and the disparity between those two messages was rather strong so I spent quite a long time trying to understand the science so I could form an opinion and, and did. I could praise it very easily. Um, we've known for well over 100 years that these greenhouse gases do trap long-wave radiation, and that is a fact and it's not disputed by anyone at all. We know that we've been releasing vast quantities of those gases into the atmosphere, and, the, and that's a fact, <clears throat> and we know that the concentration should go up, that's a fact, and we can measure the fact the concentration's gone up, and that's a fact and no one disputes it. You should therefore expect warming to have occurred, and you can measure that, and indeed it has. And of course, the Barclay data released just recently, for some people may be not familiar with that, but essentially um, a group of individuals who were doubtful that, that global warming was indeed happening, mm -hmm. funded a study to see whether indeed it was not. And uh, I think perhaps to a little bit to their surprise, they found that not only was it happening, but in fact it was perhaps slightly worse than others had measured it at all. Mm -hmm. We've had probably some 1.6 degree temperature rise over, over land in the last few decades. So that's also a fact. We know it's not due to the things that have changed Earth's atmosphere in the past, uh, sorry, Earth's temperature, because we know what those are. They're changes in the elliptical orbit of the Earth in its tilt, its wobble, and the precession of the, of the axis of the Earth. We know it's not down to things like sunspots. So the things that have affected Earth's temperature over millennia are not what's driving the temperature change now. And the science would tell us how much warming we would predict from the change in greenhouse gas we've got, and that's what we measure. Mm -hmm. And it's a difficult one to refute, because if one says it isn't that, one's got to come up with, well, what is causing the Earth to warm? Mm -hmm. And no one can think of anything else either. So I think this, the, the data is solid. Uh, even those that had, I think, understandable doubts are now convinced, because they've published their own scientific data, published out of Berkeley. Um, so I think that's now put to rest. What we're seeing echoing around are um, recycling of old debates from a very long time ago that are made to look as if they're fresh. Uh, I hope that will soon decay and we can start getting on uh, with the real business of addressing change. And I should make clear again, just to, to just be clear on this, this is not to say we need to be knocking down conventional business and destroying them because they're somewhere standing in the way. We need to help reinforce that actually there is an urgency. There's an urgency which has opportunity for those businesses and other individuals as well. Mm -hmm. um, we should support them in making that transition. Mm -hmm. And just to, to bring it back to health before we wrap up, you've mentioned all these different types of health impacts that we could expect from climate change. Yes. Are we seeing them though? Is this something that's happening now or is, are you looking into the future? Are you looking at your kids' generations and thinking, you know, this is why I need to be worried? No, I have absolutely no doubt it's happening now at all. Uh, and uh, I'm absolutely looking at my own life expectancy which is probably relatively short but those of my children which is hopefully a little longer. Um, one of the problems with science of course is that um, normal distributions are, are, the, are the currency of science. Mm -hmm. Events become increasingly or less uh, increasingly likely over a distribution mm -hmm. that's known as normal distribution. So nailing any one event as saying that was caused by X is something that scientists are very reticent to do. So for instance, if you're a smoker and you get lung cancer, can I say absolutely with certainty that your lung cancer was caused by your smoking habit? Mm -hmm. No, I can't because there are occasional people, very few, but occasional ones who get lung cancer who don't smoke. But you could say it is exceedingly likely because actually the bulk of lung cancers of that particular sort would have been caused by cigarette smoking. So we are with climate change we were predicting for instance an increase in extreme weather events mm -hmm. now we've had changes in hurricane patterns we've had a fifth of pakistan underwater last year we've had intense fires from an exceedingly large heat wave in russia last year collapse of agriculture with massive increases in grain prices partly from the loss of that wheat production and partly from speculation on it 
Um, we've got Thailand substantially underwater now in Vietnam with the collapse of the rice crop by potentially as much as 20%, losing the exports going to there. All of these sorts of things are exactly what you would anticipate happening. And a report recently by scientists, only within the last few months, released showing indeed for the United Nations, saying indeed we would exactly expect this sort of increase in extreme weather events. So even if it was just that one element, yes, we are already seeing it. We are already seeing, and it's been well published, changes in smaller things. Patterns and types of pollen that are more allergenic in terms of causing asthma and hay fever from ragweed. Well documented now. So is it here now? Yes, it is here now. And the point I'd make about that is we're seeing those changes with what's probably around a 0 0.76, 0 0.78 degree global temperature rise. The negotiations here are talking about limiting things to one and a half. One and a half. Well, if this is what we're getting at 1.74, what happens when we go so much more? It won't be a linear change. It'll be a, a much more more rapid change than that. And of course one and a half uh, degrees Celsius temperature rise would be seen as a good result here if that happened actually you're kind of on a trajectory for, for significantly more than that at the moment. Well and bear in mind of course as well that negotiators are predicated on shooting for a 50-50 chance of 1.5 so it's not even that we're shooting for a certainty of, of averting that mm -hmm. at all. With some uh, alarming messages coming out but it sounds um, from what we've heard so far that it's all to play here for the talks if we can get some political will so let's hope that uh, so we can achieve that over the coming weeks. Well I think that's true um, but I also wouldn't want anyone who's watching this to be disenfranchised at home and to think well actually there's nothing I can do it's all down to these people who negotiate and they probably won't do very much and therefore I should slash my wrists because the truth is there are a lot of things that people can do at home and that's not just about light bulbs and recycling paper it's about engaging the political process it's about choosing where people spend their money, mm -hmm. uh, issues such as that. And, and people should start taking action on those matters at home because, in fact, it may well be the people watching this that are the people who will really make the difference. Maybe it's this interview and the others you're doing today that will be the ones that actually make the difference from COP. Hugh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really interesting to talk to you. We're going to go to a, a short video now um, and we'll come back with uh, our next interview in uh, a few minutes' time.